My name is Tim McClelland. I'm a fourth generation farmer from Birchip in northwestern Victoria. We have a six and a half thousand hectare property here at Birchip where we farm crops, wheat, barley, canola, lentils, field peas, oats and some hay and then we also have livestock uh, being sheep on the farm where we have merinos for wool production and then we have a Coopworth Dorset cross that we put across our merinos for prime lamb production. Uh, our average annual rainfall is about 350 millimetres per year annual and our growing season is about 250 uh, which gives us a long-term wheat yield potential of about 2.2 tonnes to the hectare. Uh, our soil types that we're working with here are relatively uniform or consistent. Uh, so we do have some paddocks where we have some sandy clay loam, um, but the bulk of our farm is clay loam. Uh, and we do have to work with some subsoil constraints being boron and salinity issues at depth. They're constantly in battle with, with each other, the crops and the livestock dealing with feed gaps, which tend to occur in the autumn and spring periods. So there's the ongoing battle uh, with our farm to manage that the feed demand for our sheep while adhering to optimal agronomic practices. We're very fortunate here at Birchip that we've had a good run of seasons during the teens, 2010 through to 2019. So our business is in a consolidation period. So we've spent a lot of money and a lot of effort in upgrading our machinery over recent years, uh, which is getting us up to a level where we can operate effectively. A couple of years ago, uh, it became apparent that our cedar just wasn't up to the job anymore. It was a 20 year old smail bar with a Horde Bagshaw air cut on the back of it. Uh, it wasn't doing a great job with very uneven emergence. Certain gangs were running higher and lower than others. Um, so it was time to upgrade our cedar. So our motivation for upgrading our cedar was the fact that our old cedar was, just wasn't doing the job rather than trying to seek out a precision ag opportunity. Uh, but given that we were upgrading, we did think in terms of future proof proofing that purchase, we decided to have a, a variable rate component um, added into it. Uh, so when I was thinking about it, there were three things that we could vary. We've got a triple bin, so there is seed, there is nitrogen fertiliser and then there's phosphorus fertiliser. Seed, I just don't think uh, is applicable. The complication that comes from nitrogen fertiliser is that there's the mineralisation component. So that was why we started with phosphorus because it was it's more stable uh, in in what you provide in what you supply versus what you remove, which would mean that it would take out an extra level of complexity in working out. Uh, what we were going to vary. In the 2018 season, we had a pretty ordinary uh, breaking rain. It was the first rain that we'd had for a while, so we had a fairly staggered germination across the farm. So anything that was a uh, heavy textured soil didn't come up, and anything that was a lighter textured soil did come up. So I paid about $200 to $300 to get uh, an NDVI image for, um, from about a month post sowing. So then that gave me zones across every paddock across the whole farm just from that $200 image. I didn't want to jump in and do the whole farm, vary the whole farm in the first year. So I picked 10 of our more variable paddocks from across the farm and I created two or three zones depending on how variable the soil types were across that paddock. Yeah. So we went out and took soil tests across each of the zones which then came back and told us how much phosphorus was that were there in each of those zones, which we could then vary or alter our rates of phosphorus according to those soil test results. I needed to check that what we were doing was right. So when I created our prescription maps, I made sure that I had a phosphorus rich and a phosphorus deficient strip in each of the paddocks. So hopefully we would see a response to the zero phosphorus, which would mean that the phosphorus that we applied in other parts of the paddock was correct and a phosphorus rich strip. So if we saw a response to the phosphorus rich strip, then maybe we didn't apply enough in each of those zones. In six out of the 10 paddocks, you could see a clear visual response to the zero phosphorus. Uh, it didn't happen in all of them. Uh, in some places we could see the phosphorus rich strip, um, but it certainly wasn't uh, as clear cut as the zero strip. So 
in that sense, uh, we felt as though we got the, the method right in terms of um, matching our phosphorus application rates to those soil tests. So yes, we could see it visually in the paddock in terms of the biomass. Yes, we could see it from the NDVI. It really didn't carry through to the yield on the, on the yield maps. Uh, we're still in the process of analysing it, which is one of the issues that I've come up against, is that it's very difficult to statistically anal analyse the results of um, test strips relative to the, the other parts of the paddock. So the question is, is it worth uh, going to all this effort with the variable rate phosphorus if it doesn't come through to yield? Uh, look, you'd think that there must be some, if you can see a visual response in the paddock, you must think that there must be, in the long run, some kind of response to phosphorus. So. Uh, I'm still in the process of analysing some of the results from the 2019 season, but I think it is something that we'll continue with in the future. So when we started implementing the variable rate phosphorus across the farm, I thought that it might generate a bit of a saving in phosphorus usage, because I thought we might have been overdoing it in, uh, in some parts of the farm. Uh, but what actually ended up happening is that our phosphorus usage didn't change at all. And across the 10 paddocks, so let's call it about a thousand hectares, uh, with the standard practice, uh, my MAP usage was 60 tonnes, and with the variable rate phosphorus, it was 59.5. So in the end, after all that work, it was half a tonne uh, different. Uh, however, you would hope that we might be applying phosphorus where it's needed. Um, so we're transferring from areas where it's not needed to areas where it is more needed. So hopefully there is still a benefit there that, uh, that uh, improves our yields on average across the farm. It's hard to judge uh, because it's, you sort of do it in dribs and drabs and do a little bit here at sowing and a little bit uh, at harvest and a little bit uh, getting the NDVI image processed. But I'd say it was about three to four weeks of my time to get it all up and running and operational. Uh, the NDVI image for our zoning was about $300 for the whole farm. There's some extra costs in soil testing. Uh, the software, we spend about $1,500 a year on that subscription. I think it's going to be useful in analysing some of the, the trials that we put in the grounds. Uh, in terms of the cost of the cedar, um, we were always going to get the variable rate component. So I never actually asked for a quote of the variable rate cost on top of the, the cedar itself, so I don't know the answer to that, uh, but yeah, the, the change over the cedar was a substantial cost, but I'm pretty sure that we're paying ourselves back already through better germination efficiency, and we can get across the farm a whole lot faster, which means that the more of our crop is sown on time, which is, uh, is really important. What would I do differently? I'd probably go and get a grid sample on one of the paddocks. So then I could compare that to my NDVI method, which is something I can still do, and I'll probably be getting in touch with uh, one of the PA specialists to, to go through that process with me. Um, yeah, that's something that we're looking to do in the future. So where to next uh, with Precision Ag on the farm? Uh, I think it's just extending more of the same. So we're doing variable rate phosphorus. So the next step, obvious step, is to do variable rate urea. Uh, now that we've got our soil texture maps, it's relatively easy for me to create urea maps and apply that across our urea spreader and our cedar down the tube as well. The other thing that we're looking to do on farm is to get into a weeder to weed seeker uh, technology. There seems to be more summer rain coming through uh, in recent years. So I can really see the potential for savings in summer herbicide usage by adopting some of the weed seeker or weed technology. That's something that we'll be looking to get into in the future. However, we really don't try not to make purchases or make decisions without critically analysing it or assessing it before we go ahead with it. So I'm writing a paper up at the moment to assess uh, just what the potential savings in chemical usage will be. Uh, it is looking like it should have good savings in the early numbers that I've done, but uh, yeah, we'll certainly be uh, having a discussion at this at our next board meeting to decide whether it's something that we go ahead with because the, we know that the, the investment is substantial.